Welcome to everyone. This is our third in the Winter Learning Series webinars. My name is Dana Ripper. I'm with the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Ethan Duke is also here with MRBO. Our mission is conservation via science, education, and advocacy. And we've put together this series to hopefully help inform folks about a number of different very important topics and possibly inspire you all to take action for conservation. So with us tonight, we're very excited to have Dr. Christine Brodsky from Pitt State University. I know we have a lot of Kansas City people here tonight. So if you know Merbo's very own Tessa Pullman, who has been with us for the last six months, Dr. Brodsky was a mentor of hers um, at Pitt State. A little bit about Christine Brodsky. She's an associate professor of biology at Pittsburgh State University. Over the past 10 years, her research has focused on how wildlife species respond to urbanization, mainly focusing on bird and mammal communities and the human dimensions of these systems. As an advisory board member of the International Urban Biodiversity and Design Network, she is engaged with urban ecology and biodiversity research at global and national scales. She received her PhD in wildlife ecology from the University of Missouri and currently resides in Joplin. So Christine, welcome. Thank you so much for being here and take it away. Thank you all so much for having me. It's really nice to see such engagement with uh, environmental topics. I'm very impressed by, oh my goodness, 146 attendees and I'm loving everyone coming from Columbia, Missouri. <laughs> um, so uh, just, Briefly tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my research over the past, gosh, I guess it is about 10 years, which is ridiculous how quickly time flies. Um, but I would just generally classify myself as an urban ecologist, uh, urban wildlife ecologist with that. My research primarily deals with birds and mammals, and I kind of sprinkled in both taxonomic groups today. Um, but Today, I'll just talk a little bit about what my colleagues and I have been studying and the types of questions that we've been asking, uh, just generally about urban wildlife diversity um, at multiple scales. So these projects that I'll be discussing today um, occur locally in Pittsburgh, uh, which is in Southeast Kansas, all the way up to the global scale. And none of this can be done without all of the amazing people um, that I've had the honor and privilege of working with. Um, science is very collaborative and uh, I've been very lucky uh, to have worked with so many fabulous people um, within my collaborative networks, but also all of the abundant uh, students at Pittsburgh State. So a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today um, is from their efforts on the ground um, and beyond. So to kick things off, um, we all know that the er world is becoming more and more urban, right? Cities are getting bigger, they're sprawling outward, um, but they're also getting more dense. And there are new cities popping up around the world at an incredibly fast rate, um, which is not surprising. We're hearing about population growth, hitting over 8 billion people on the planet. And the vast majority of these people today are living in what we call urban centers or urban uh, ecosystems. And we hit that point around uh, 2010, where we surpassed the number of people living in more rural areas to now becoming a global urban society. So that was back in 2010, and it's estimated within a 20-year time span, so between 2010 and 2030, which is right around the corner, we are going to add about 1.2 million square kilometers of urban lands to the planet. So that would triple the amount of urban land cover that we had from 2010 to 2030. So that's a pretty short time span to grow that quickly in this planet. And 1.2 million square kilometers, that's kind of difficult number even to comprehend. So to give you kind of a visual, that would be like adding 
the space of California and Texas as a city onto the planet that wasn't there in 2020, but will be there in 2030. So we are expanding quite rapidly and changing a lot of the land on Earth into this brand new system where animals and plants haven't had to deal with these types of disturbances on the landscape. So as an urban ecologist, we're kind of at the forefront of these land use changes and trying to anticipate how wildlife and biodiversity overall is going to respond. But before we get into biodiversity, let's first talk about the word urban. So what does it mean to be urban? This is a big thing that's in uh, the papers and the literature of trying just to define what it means because it's very dependent on what you perceive and quite frankly, where you grew up. So if I were to do a survey of what people think urban is or the words that are associated with a city or the word urban, I bet it's going to look something like this, right? So we have tall buildings, skyscrapers, um, some pavement, not a lot of greenery. There's very few vegetative features, but maybe there's a tree here and there. But predominantly, the landscape is going to be um, impervious surfaces. So asphalt, pavements, buildings, things that are trapping um, water and air into the soil. So it's impervious surface. And this might be a familiar site to some of y'all joining in. This is downtown Kansas City. So that's pretty agreed upon. That is very much a city. It says it in the name. It has to be. Um, but we also consider this a city. So we still have buildings, obviously not skyscrapers, but um, it's clearly a human-centric location, right? It's not as dense as the previous photograph. There's not as many people, but technically it's still urban as classified by the United States Census. And that's where I work in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Um, it's a very small town. It's only about 20,000 people and it's max, um, but it's still urban. So those two are pretty different. So let's go back to that in a bit. But the last picture, I would argue it's probably the most urban of the locations. And you're looking at this and you're like, that's not urban. There's plants and trees and life. However, this is a picture of Central Park in Manhattan. So it's very much contextually dependent on a lot of features, not only what's in that area right then, but it's also what's surrounding that location. What are the um, filters enacted by urbanization to either constrain species from coming into that site, or are we manipulating species to come in through our actions? So what urban is we are interested in this uh, from our research collaborations, and my colleagues and I published a paper um, in 2022 where we read uh, just about 1,200 uh, papers that studied urban biodiversity, and we asked, okay, well, how do these papers classify what it means to be urban? The vast majority said it's within a city's boundaries. So we can draw an outline of Kansas City, and if we are in that outline, we are an urban study. That's a city's boundary. But that doesn't really tell us much, right? Because some cities are sprawling quite large um, and may not have that big of a population. So that population density is quite small. Um, but other cities are quite small and very, very dense. So that's not really the best metric to use. A lot of people, though, use a combination of land use and land cover. So that goes back to those photographs. What do we see when we're in these cities? Is it primarily buildings and asphalt and pavement, or is it a forest or a grassland or a wetland? That's a pretty clear indication if we're working within a city. Other papers used uh, the population density of an area to describe the city. Others just used how much impervious cover is present. Is it 100% or is it 5%? And as we go along, some other papers use pretty unique and creative ways to describe what an urban area is, like how many buildings there are in a particular area. Same thing with roads. Um, one creative way is to look at 
noise? Is it very noisy from cars honking and people, or is it quite quiet and more natural sounds? Um, so there's a lot of ways we could go about uh, identifying an urban area, but the best are combinations. So we can capture those variations. Um, so when we're looking at that picture of Central Park, we can understand all of these aspects like population density, building density in that area and say, yes, 100% that is the most urban of those three examples. So overall, we are going to refer to urban today as uh, a combination of a lot of these features. So high population densities, same thing with high housing or building densities, high amounts of impervious features like asphalt and pavement, uh, less vegetation, more roads, and usually it's bound within some kind of administrative uh, property of city center or the outskirts of a particular city. So when we look at these three pictures, so let's say Kansas City, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis, they all look pretty darn similar, right? We have buildings, we have roads, cars, people, etc. And that is called something in the urban ecology literature. It's called biotic homogenization. So that's a pretty large word. Just essentially that means we're losing the uniqueness of these areas as it becomes more urbanized. So we might start off with a beautiful prairie, a tall grass prairie in this region, but as we urbanize, as we pour concrete and build buildings, um, it starts to look pretty similar to a lot of cities around the United States at least. So we're losing that unique aspect of those natural features to a more urban center. And this is a great example uh, from a paper by Peter Groffman uh, looking at those natural areas outside of Miami and outside of Phoenix. And those look pretty distinct, very wet kind of tropical area outside of Miami to a very dry desert-like environment in Phoenix. But if we go into the city centers of Miami and Phoenix, it looks the same. They're completely different climates. So we're losing a lot of that um, natural, if you will, features of that landscape. So just to drive that point home, I always do this in my classes. Uh, it's kind of a, a game that we play and we won't go terribly long just for the sake of time. But these are four cities all within the United States um, and their corresponding non-urban uh, features. So these numbers correspond with one of these letters. So maybe take a minute or so, try to figure out what does natural feature number one go to in terms of what urban area does it match with? Can you figure it out? Take a second. So maybe you want to look at the plants or the features in the native setting and try to guess where we are in the United States. And maybe if you're really good at knowing uh, the cityscape and the uh, uh, the landscape uh, of each of those cities, you might know where we are. So just for the sake of time, <laughs> I'm just going to start working on these. If you want to guess in the chat, you are welcome to. Um, it is quite tricky. And these ones, I, also, I always have my students do more than just four. So I'm taking it easy on all of y'all. So let's give it a go. I like the I like the guessing. All right, so number one, so kind of a uh, riparian forested area. So what does this belong to? Number one is just right outside of Baltimore, Maryland, and it corresponds to A. So Baltimore, Maryland, on the coast, uh, eastern seaboard, right off of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but picture A looks pretty much like anywhere in the U.S., right? So let's go with number two. Number two might be a little easy, at least in the geographic area. So can anyone guess where we are, at least geographically, in the United States with those palmettos and pines? Mm 
No. All right. We're in the Southeast. Yeah, there you go. Southeast. Miami. So number two is right outside of Miami, and that corresponds to Cityscape D. But you're looking at D, you're like, where are the palm trees? <laughs> it looks like any other place in the United States. Oh, Hawaii. I wouldn't be mean to do Hawaii. That is a completely different ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so number three, we are right outside of Boston, and C is Boston, and then lastly, Minneapolis is B. So trying to get or just communicate how tough it is to look at the cities. All the cities look the same, but the urban, non-urban areas, those natural areas look very unique and different. So that is biotic homogenization, where we're getting more and more similar. And those are a lot of pressures that we are exerting on the wildlife and the plants in these communities, um, because we're going from all of these diverse habitats outside of the cities to slightly more homogenous, more similar habitats in the cities. However, with that being said, if we were to zoom in on these cities, like if we were to zoom into picture A, Baltimore, um, I did my PhD research out in Baltimore, so I lived out there for a few years, um, and I was looking at a variety of what we call green spaces in those cities, and if we were to look at these particular areas within the cities, there is a little bit of diversity if we were to zoom in. So we have uh, an abundance of city parks, so very landscape managed areas and cities, but we also might have some remnant habitats or leftover habitats from before the city was built or um, kind of undisturbed areas. Usually we don't have a lot of those left in the cities, but some areas uh, like Forest Park in St. Louis, they do a really good job of preserving the little that's left. We also have a lot of backyards, a lot of residential areas where we can manipulate to our heart's content. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, and also develop land. There are a lot of organisms that perfectly are capable of living in downtown environments. Um, and they like to live on buildings like peregrine falcons. They do exceptionally well in areas like New York. So all of this diversity corresponds to the diversity of organisms living within cities. And all of these photographs are pictures that I've taken um, from organisms within uh, true cities, whether it's Pittsburgh or uh, out east um, or out west. So they respond to a lot of these habitat features. So urban areas, as you can hopefully already tell, they're really complex. There's a lot of stuff going on. So what we have hypothesized, um, my collaborators and I, is we have these various filters that either uh, exclude species from cities or attract species into cities, particularly due to that homogenization, but also the little habitats within the cities and the habitats that we create, like our backyard habitats, they could actually bring species into cities. So we use this kind of filtered framework. So just as an example, we start off with all of the possible species, let's say in the Midwest all of the species that could possibly belong here just with their range, where they occur, et cetera. Out of those, we're going to kind of remove some and filter some out so that we're left with only the species that occur within Missouri, just due to habitat needs, for instance. Um, they're responding to those due to their life history traits. So those are ones that they're gonna cue into particular habitats that they need, how far they can disperse. So if we're talking about a migratory bird, maybe they're using some of these areas in the city. But we're also going to be facilitating some species in through people. So we love our cats, right? We love our pets. We love uh, game animals. Sometimes we will bring those species in, like exotic uh, species, into cities, which we end up with the amount of species in one particular city. Let's use Kansas City, for instance. But species are found throughout Kansas City, but if we were to zoom into someone's backyard in Kansas City, we're going to filter out some more species, right? Uh, we may not find um, a bobcat in your backyard, just depending on where you live, but we might find um, uh, 
eastern cottontail, for instance. So there are a few things that constrain species from even getting into that local scale, that local community, based off of the features that they need in order to survive. So we're going to talk about um, a few of these studies that we did looking at these species pools, if you will, and ask questions like what makes a biodiversity, particularly the traits of the organism that allow them to be successful at that scale. So whether it's their diet, is it a specialist species that needs a huge forest patch in order to survive and to eat the foods and to have the habitat that it needs to have a nest and lay eggs? Or are we going to filter that species out um, when we urbanize that particular area? So we need to ask this in a lot of different scales, starting with the global and go down to the local. And I've had the privilege of working with a collection of folks uh, worldwide where we come together and ask questions like this. So this is the Urban Biodiversity Network. It's an international network that was funded through the National Science Foundation um, that these folks came from all over the place. I'm right now collaborating pretty heavily with a colleague from Finland, which is challenging with time difference, but we make it work. Um, but we get to ask really cool questions like this. And this is the fabulous group that uh, assisted with that big literature review that I referred to in the beginning, where we read a whole bunch of articles about um, it's pretty much any paper that studied urban biodiversity from 1990 uh, to 2019, I believe was our cutoff. And um, we found a few things. So not only did we look at how they defined what it meant to be urban, but we also wanted to know where they did their studies, on which types of organisms, and what kind of questions did they ask. So our first big finding was we are very much... Um, biasing our understanding of what it means to be a city in terms of the wildlife based off of North American, European, and Australian cities. So we really need to go beyond those countries to see what kind of cities um, there are and what organisms there are in other places of the world. Even within the United States, the vast majority of the literature comes from the cities of Chicago and Phoenix, Arizona. So for a city like Pittsburgh, Kansas, or Columbia, Missouri, we don't really know too much about the filters on small cities versus those larger cities. Additionally, we also found that most of the literature was on plants and birds. And birds are amazing, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but we do need to understand the impacts of urbanization beyond these two taxonomic groups. So for instance, we don't know a whole lot about how urbanization affects amphibians or spiders or snails. So that is a big issue when we're trying to talk about diversity as a whole. So it's very much skewed towards our plants and our birds. Lastly, we also found that most studies looked at urban ecology from a traditional lens, if you will. So what do I mean by traditional diversity metrics? So if I were to go out and survey birds in my backyard, one classic example would be to go through and count how many birds there are in my backyard. So that's a pretty traditional metric and we call that species richness. And there's other metrics like diversity um, and evenness. Um, and those are pretty traditional. However, it doesn't really tell us much because I can go to someone else's backyard and say, hey, you have five species of birds. I have five species too. But they might have starlings, pigeons, and house sparrows. But I might have uh, various woodpeckers and chickadees and other species that are completely different in terms of the traits that they had and the habitats that they require. So what we're interested in are called functional diversity metrics. So we can analyze a community, let's say this mammal community of a fox, a squirrel, and a groundhog and yes, we could say, all right, there's two species, species richness of two. Yay. Doesn't tell us much. Instead, we could be more descriptive and tie in the roles into the ecosystem. 
So I could talk about their diets and are we representing omnivores, carnivores, herbivores, granivores? What is their body mass? What kind of space do they need in order to survive? What's their activity pattern? Are they nocturnal? Are they diurnal? How many babies do they have at one time? So all of these traits are much more informative and descriptive than what we have for just a species richness of two. So we're going to look at that today, this trait-based approach to describe the functional richness and functional diversity of these communities of, are we expressing all the different types of diets even possible? Or are they all going to be omnivores and very urban, very generalist? So our prevailing hypotheses um, as to how urbanization is going to impact wildlife. So if we compare it against those non-urban systems to a city, we can say that urban systems are going to be homogenized. We're going to go from that huge diversity of all of the traits possible to very few traits. And the ones that are doing well are going to be our generalist species. So if we're talking about diet, they're going to eat anything. They could eat trash and be perfectly content. But in our non-urban systems, we're going to get those specialists, those insectivorous birds, or the birds that require um, leaf nests like oven birds in order to nest versus urban areas where they're primarily nesting in cavities. We're also going to hypothesize that very few traits are going to be seen in urban areas. So it's going to be more so just generalist versus a very highly specialized carnivore. We're going to see a lot of overlap in traits. So if we have two generalists, they might be competing for the same trash in that trash can versus an insectivore and a carnivore. They're going to be very different. We're not going to have a lot of overlap. And in urban areas, we're going to have broad tolerances to a lot of these features. So if I'm eating uh, trash out of trash can, I don't really care. It's very broad tolerance for anything that you throw at me in terms of food. I am not going to uh, really care too much versus if I'm a specialist, I am going to be very picky with what I uh, ingest. So a little bit of background to get us talking about some uh, research projects that my students and I have been doing. So um, we're going to go from the global scale to the more local scale, and we're also going to keep in mind those three things that we found through our literature review, that we want to go beyond the North American, European, Australian view of what it means to be urban. We need to get more information about other cities and other countries around the world to have a more comprehensive view of what urbanization does to our wildlife. We also want to go beyond birds and plants to understand other species um, and how they are impacted by wildlife and also focus on that functional feature of these urban systems and the organisms that live in urban systems. So the first, I'm going to talk a little bit more about our uh, urban biodiversity network. Um, so once again, this was a uh, grant funded collaboration. Um, and this particular project that I'm going to be talking about was spearheaded by Amy Haas from the University of Melbourne. So she's already on the left, um, where we solicited uh, data sets from collaborators around the world, then we pretty much said, do you have a data set on any kind of organism that we can track to the particular area and have trait information on it? So we can ask how urbanization affects biodiversity. And lucky for us, we got a lot of responses. So we were able to collect data from just about six uh, taxonomic groups that we have here, which were amphibians, uh, bats, bees, birds, carabid beetles, and various reptiles around the world. Um, all in all, we had data from just over 5,000 species from 379 cities and 48 countries. And while we definitely got a global snapshot of what's going on in terms of urban wildlife, there are very clearly still areas that have yet to be um, delved into, at least with this uh, study but we're trying our best <laughs> for expanding outward beyond the United States, Europe, and Australia.
So of these six types of organisms, we were interested in their traits. So what was their body size? What was their diet, uh, reproductive capabilities? And how did that change as we moved in and out of a city? So this is just uh, a way to look at some of these species individually. Um, Birds, we are very lucky to have a whole lot of data um, from around the world, um, but there are still a lot of species that are very, or studied very heavily in one particular area, like carabid beetles. Apparently, Europeans love their carabid beetles. All right, and this is what we found. And there's a lot on this slide, so I'm going to break this down uh, one by one. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to is that on the bottom, this x-axis, we are looking at a gradient of urbanization. And if we recall our original conversation about what it means to be urban, we wanted to incorporate a lot of different features to get a comprehensive view of what it means to be urban. So not just say it's in a city boundary. So we did um, a mixture of uh, how much urban cover there was, so how much impervious surface, but also how much natural forested land cover is within those areas. We also factored in latitude because we can anticipate there will be different species depending on uh, where they are in the earth, as well as climatic region. So we standardized this a lot to get a comprehensive view of what it meant to be urban. And this is what we found. And again, it looks like a whole bunch, but we are going to zoom in and focus on ones that have asterisks because those were trends that had urbanization driving their trends. So we're going to focus on those because that's what we were interested in asking. We're also going to focus on the ones that have bold coloration because those ones explain the data well. So the statistics were in our favor and it was doing a really good job explaining these trends. So I'm going to just get rid of the ones that we are going to pass over, and this is what we are left with. So what's going on here? So we could see that we have four traits that are represented, so body size, uh, feeding, mobility, and reproduction. And then we also have some other features, which we'll go into in a bit. But the ones on the top, these colorful ones, we can see that urbanization affects all of them. So urbanization is going to affect um, the body size of these organisms. So if we're looking at um, crabbed beetles, when we have, when we go from a natural area to more urban area, their body size decreases. Comparatively, if we go from a natural area to a more urban area for bats, we are going to increase our body size. So these are what the trends we are focusing on right now. So urbanization affects body size, feeding, mobility, and reproduction. And one thing that we could also see, the trends are not the same. So even the example that I just provided, urbanization is going to impact body size in completely different ways depending on which group we are interested in. Same thing with mobility. As uh, we get more into the city center, we start to see a shift where the birds that were long distance migrants, they're going to be filtered out. And the ones that are left within the city are primarily um, residential, so they don't really disperse pretty that far. Opposite's true for these beetles. Urban beetles like to move around. So we're calling this uh, different types of urban syndromes. Urbanization is not good or bad for these species. We're just seeing a shift in what species are allowed to live in urban areas based off of their traits. So all of these taxa show distinct responses to urbanization. In particular, reproduction is the one that's hit the strongest. So that has pretty severe conservation implications where we're seeing a shift in how species reproduce in areas. So with birds, it's going to be clutch sizes. So how many eggs a bird lays on average per nest. With urbanization, that number goes down. 
So that's a pretty substantial conservation implication um, when we're talking about trying to conserve and save species that are in urban areas um, within one species, they might be reproducing less. So since we are the Missouri River Bird Observing observatory. Let's just zoom in to the good ones, the birds, even though, yes, birds are very highly researched in this type of uh, research area, but birds are the best. So we'll go with it. So these are the bird findings. So again, what did we find? Um, we already talked about body size, so feeding, we actually go from uh, specialist to more generalist birds. So again, specialist birds would be uh, insectivorous birds, um, carnivorous birds, uh, birds that eat fish, uh, piscivores, to more generalist. So seed eaters or backyard birds, the birds can, can pretty much live anywhere and be fine. House sparrows, European starlings. Uh, dispersal. Highly migratory birds in rural areas, more residential birds in cities, and reproduction again, fewer birds uh, are, fewer eggs are laid per nest with urban birds. But these uh, trends we didn't really touch upon. So again, we're looking at the ones that have asterisk that are explained by urbanization and the darker colored ones that have a strong support for the data that we have. So species richness, that was when we we're just counting how many birds we have, one, two, three, four, five birds, um, species that are in my backyard. We see here a very strong decline where in urban areas we have fewer bird species. So a lot of bird species are being filtered out of cities most likely due to the feeding that's available um, and the clutch sizes. They're gonna do better in non-urban areas where they can get the food that they need and they could have a lot of babies. We also have functional dispersion going down. So that means that urban birds are more generalist species, that they have broad environmental tolerances. So like our European starlings, our house sparrows, they can eat anything, they can pretty much live anywhere, they do just fine. They are tolerant of a lot of these urban conditions. So all of this, what does this tell us about birds? So first and foremost, Urbanization is causing a decline in bird species that are able to live in cities. It's not great in terms of conservation. Um, and the ones that are able to live in cities, so the ones that haven't been filtered out, they have more generalist diets and um, they have an increased site fidelity. So they stay put. So that is tells us something about conservation action. So if they're gonna stay put, we're gonna call these central place foragers. So we describe these urban syndromes um, to classify the types of organisms that can live in cities. So in birds, at least, they aren't gonna disperse terribly far. So they're gonna stay maybe in one patch, maybe they'll use someone's backyard, maybe a park down the road, but they're gonna kind of come back to their territories. So maintaining that type of habitat is so necessary um, for conserving bird species and possibly increasing uh, species richness through conservation action. And again, overall, urbanization strongly selects for or against a species reproduction. So we need to ensure that the species, once they um, lay eggs, we want to make sure that their the fledglings are surviving. Uh, and there's a whole uh, bunch of literature uh, on that subject area itself. So again, that's just for birds. There's a lot going on for all of these other species. Um, so for time, that was a global study where we asked birds from all of these cities all throughout the world. So let's go to a slightly more narrow uh, geographic scope but still again, fulfilling our promise of sampling more areas than just big cities. Um, and let's talk about a different taxonomic group. So Snapshot USA is a fabulous nationwide um, 
research project that I've been a part of since 2019, and we are studying mammals uh, in this project. It's not an urban project um, in its design, um, but a lot of places that we do sample are urban, so we could ask some urban questions, which I'll get to next. Um, but in this project, uh, my colleagues and I put out game cameras across all 50 states in the United States uh, between the months of September and October. So we run our cameras, and they could take photos of any mammal that passes by in that time period. So we get a snapshot, if you will, of the mammals in all of these places around the United States at that one time. And we've been collecting data now for five years, which is really exciting. We just did our fifth uh, sampling uh, back in uh, September and October of last year. And we could use this huge data set to ask questions about habitat associations and urbanization. Um, and lucky for us, especially the educators possibly in this webinar, these data sets are available for free online. So if you want to analyze the data yourself or have a group of folks that would like to do a project, uh, you could download this from the journal Ecology. Right now we have our 2019 and 2020 data sets published. Hopefully 2021 uh, will be out soon. So my colleagues and I are part of Snapshot USA, which these are the co-authors of the paper that I will be explaining next. We all came together and said, hey, we really like mammals. We also are really interested in urbanization. Let's ask some great questions with this huge data set that, again, comes from all 50 states. Um, this project, though, we are only going to focus on the contiguous uh, 48 uh, states just because Hawaii and Alaska have completely different mammal communities as compared to um, the continental U.S. So we are only focusing on these 48. And what we did here, we were asking those same questions. What is urbanization doing to these mammals? Is it shifting the diet features, the body size, et cetera. And we were looking at the impacts of urbanization, um, but we also, uh, in surveying these 107 locations, found that agriculture had a pretty distinct presence on the landscape, as well as suburban areas. So we defined a suburban area as an area with a lot of houses, but very few roads. So a very distinct kind of habitat compared to kind of a downtown city like we see with Seattle and Detroit. So what did we find here? Um, so we primarily looked at urban areas and talked about divergence, evenness, and richness. So if it has a color, it means it was significant and urbanization explained this trend. So what does this mean? So urban areas had higher functional richness, which means, which is something great for the community, is that more traits are present in the community. So we saw the opposite with birds, but now we see that in urban areas, the mammals actually have a lot of unique traits. So we get to have some uh, insectivorous mammals and other mammals um, maybe that are more omnivorous. They're all kind of present in these urban areas. So um, we see a lot of that richness going on. Same thing with our agricultural areas. There are more traits present in the community. However, functional evenness was lower, which means that um, if we have two species, again, using diet as an example, if we have a carnivore and we have an omnivore, they are going to be completely distinct from one another. So they're not going to be competing very much. And that's a good thing, too. So we see that separation. And lastly, for suburban areas, um, we had high functional evenness. So it means that those species overlapped. So we might have multiple carnivores overlapping and competing for the same resources. So um, those are pretty theoretical um, uh, metrics. So let's look at the actual traits. So what's actually going on in these cities. So we found that in urban areas, the species that are able to be successful, so again, the ones that are filtered into the city, are ones that have small home ranges. So they're not moving around quite a bit. They're kind of staying centered in their little 
homes, their spots. So we saw the same thing with birds, right? They are homebodies. They don't need to go very far if you're in a city because all the resources are right there for you. Versus in suburban areas, the mammals that were very successful were ones that had uh, large home range sizes. So they need to search and go really far to find the resources that they need. Correspondingly, um, body mass. So usually if an animal is small, it has a small home range size. If the animal is big, it has a large home range size. So this wasn't terribly um, surprising. So uh, urban mammals tended to be small. <laughs> Suburban animals tend to be large, which again, not terribly surprising. We see squirrels and rabbits and uh, small rodents uh, in urban areas, maybe a small carnivore, but we save the big uh, mammals for outside the city and the suburbs. In terms of diet, fewer carnivores were able to get into cities. So we are filtering out carnivores from our cities, but they are being filtered in to agricultural areas. And same thing with diet, we had fewer species that are scavengers. So most of the mammals in urban areas have small home ranges, they're a small body, they're not really a carnivore, they're not really a scavenger, they're more omnivorous versus our agricultural areas had high detections of scavengers. And this goes beyond just one particular species. We see a lot of shifts um, throughout species. So for instance, if we're just looking at carnivores themselves, if we're looking within that um, taxonomic order, that group, we see completely different means of responding to urbanization. But again, it comes down to their traits. Even though these both belong to carnivora, uh, an urban fox is a small body-sized organism. Um, it uh, is slightly more, um, it eats a whole bunch of stuff, but it is more slightly more carnivorous uh, in compared to a black bear. Huge animal, large home range, and completely different diet, even though it's within some the same order. So we see a lot of changes with different species depending on what uh, taxonomic group they belong to. So overall, our big findings with this paper is that urban mammals have a lot of traits present. They are functionally rich. However, they tend to be small body sized, uh, less carnivorous, um, but some are slightly more flexible than one another. So an urban fox can do just well in urban area, but also do probably just fine in a suburban area. So it's slightly more flexible. All right, and last but not least, and just very quickly, I'm going to talk about a local example that will factor in some other features of these mechanisms of drawing species into areas or excluding species out. And this research came from uh, my graduate student, Katie McMurray. She did her master's uh, work with me looking at urban birds and butterflies, so uh, Lepidoptera species. And she was asking, you know, what kind of species were present in people's backyards in Pittsburgh, Kansas. So we can again look at what habitat features are there. So she found that there were more um, butterfly species in backyards with more trees, um, greater shrub coverage, uh, water resources, and native plants. And there are more bird species in areas with more trees and more shrubs. So more places to forage, more places for nesting opportunities, etc. So these weren't terribly surprising. Um, we found that in the literature. However, talking about things that exclude or attract species to people's backyards, we haven't really talked about this yet, but people play a huge role in cities. So we're looking at society impacts. So with this project, Katie also um, surveyed residents. So they, she gave them a survey, asked them um, just about who they are, uh, the types of management practices they do in their backyards, um, and some of their demographic traits. And she found that in backyards where uh, the resident had a slightly higher income, and if they owned their house, we saw greater species richness in birds, which makes sense. If you are a homeowner, and if you have 
money um, to put out bird feeders. Bird feed is expensive. So that is going to attract more species to your backyards. So there's a social uh, economic component to biodiversity. And she also looked at how people manage their backyards and found it's usually one of three. So a traditional lawn, you do a lot of mowing, maybe some herbicide, maybe some pesticide application. Uh, mixed, where you have mostly yard um, mode, but maybe some little islands of vegetation. And then natural, you don't really mow very much. Um, there's no one just cluster of plants kind of just all over the place growing naturally. And we found, not surprisingly, birds and butterflies liked the natural setting more. They had more resources to go off of. However, going back to that social component, people are pressured into maintaining that traditional yard-like habitat. And they got a lot of pushback when they wanted to do this natural setting. So there's a lot of social biological uh, climate. And there's so many things going on in our cities that it's really difficult to tease apart these trends. But overall, what we're finding now, again, there's no one urbanization syndrome. Some species do very well in cities, others not so much. And even beyond the species group, the higher taxonomic groups like birds, amphibians, reptiles, um, bats, they have these different syndromes. So we proposed four syndromes in that paper that I was referring to before. So with birds being in one space and kind of hopping around, but kind of um, they're going back home versus other species like bats, where if they're going to fly everywhere, sample everything. They have a lot of mobility. They're more generalist. They do just fine. So some organisms will exploit urban resources, like our diet generalists. They do just fine with the buffet of food options. However, many other species are sensitive, and they're going to be excluded or filtered out of cities because of their uh, traits. And this is just skimming the surface. There's a lot of social economic impacts on how we design our cities um, and even our backyards, which it might be small, but if we do it at a large scale in a whole neighborhood, it's gonna have a pretty big impact on the conservation of these species. And conserving urban species and urban biodiversity is super important um, in an increasingly urban world. Um, but these systems are so complex and we're still trying to learn about them. Their field of urban ecology as a discipline really only got started in the 90s, which I would like to think is not that long ago. <laughs> so we're still pretty much in the infancy of this uh, research question. So a lot more questions to be asked and to be answered, and it really takes a village. So I'm once again very grateful for all of my collaborators and students and uh, lovely people who I've had the joy of working with in this time period. So that was a lot of information <laughs> in about 50 minutes. Um, so I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, if I don't get to answering your questions just for time, that's my email. You're more than welcome to reach out to me. Um, and also, if you want to learn a little bit more about our global urban biodiversity network or the Snapshot USA program, I left some information how you can get more information there. But thank you all so much for um, listening. And yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Christina. I hope you can see there's some some thanks and some praise yeah. coming in in the chat there from lots and lots of folks. Mm -hmm. We do have a few questions in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Um, Jack asks, any evidence that Doug Tallamy is right about attracting more wildlife by planting more natives, or is it too soon to really tell? So I got to say I am biased with that question because uh, I did my master's uh, at the University of Delaware where Doug Tallamy was the chair. So um, Doug and I go back uh, at least to 2012. <laughs> um, I would say say so. Uh, there's a lot of data that, as he probably described in, he, he already gave his talk, yes? Um, or maybe he's, he's later. Coming up. Yep, he's oh, coming okay. Up. Yep. So you could ask him about this too. Um, 
but his research has found that um, areas with more native plants attract more native uh, insects, which then we scale it up uh, with the food web and the ecosystem. So in areas with more native plants, more insects, more birds. So we see this, what we call a trophic cascade kind of. Um, so that is one aspect, but um, if we're just looking at insects, that's a pretty um, narrow view of it, because if we provide plants, we're also providing structure. If we're just talking about birds, let's say. So if we have a few shrubs, we're giving um, foraging opportunities. So not only insects, but um, if it's a berry producing plant, uh, we're getting areas where these species can hide away from predators. If we're talking about aerial predators, um, areas to nest. So there's a lot of things happening. So if we really have any indication of vegetation and we could have this whole debate and very much you could ask him the, uh, is it better to have an empty area or is it better to have plants, but they're exotic plants, that's a whole ball of wax. <laughs> I would argue that it's better to have some kind of vegetation structure, even if it's exotic, than to have nothing at all. All right. Christine, uh, Devin asks, clutch size is smaller, um, as you presented for Birds and City. Mm -hmm. but is there less pressure on existing eggs to survive to fledging, less predation? In urban areas, or it's not necessarily more or less predation, just the predators shift. So in urban areas, if again, we're talking about birds, um, we are going to see more mammalian uh, predators and I believe more corvids, so blue jays. There was a paper that looked at this in particular. Um, so when I was doing my uh, PhD research in Baltimore, I was looking particularly at uh, nest success in urban vacant lots and asking those kinds of questions. Um, and I came up on one nest and there was literally a cat sitting in the nest of the bird. <laughs> so they have different predators and they have to evolve hopefully to um, uh, not necessarily avoid predation, but be more successful. So um, one thing that we could ask, which we didn't in this one paper, was even though clutch sizes are small, um, are urban birds uh, able to easily double clutch? So if they have a failure, are they more able to just say, you know, that was a loss, let me do this again, compared to uh, individuals who are more rural. So even if one species, um, some birds can easily double or even triple clutch um, like robins. Um, but that might be an excellent question actually on research to look at that over an urbanization gradient to see if they're more able to do so. Um, because yes, there will be predators regardless of where we are, but it's how they respond to that kind of predation. So that was a great question. Keep your cats inside, people. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get off my soapbox on that one. <laughs> I, we, we, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> Christine, Eth, did you want to go? To go through the questions or ask my own? <laughs> mm. <laughs> um. Um, so we do have another question from Kristen. It says, uh, were you able to get non-urban control-like data near the research locations to compare across the urban ag and suburban categories or just looking within groups themselves? So that one, I believe, was in reference to the mammal paper where we looked at the mammal communities across the United States. So controls, that is a huge discussion in urban ecology as a discipline of what does control really mean? Because if we talk about rural, that means a whole bunch of things. So around here, rural can be agriculture, which is still a human modification to the environment. So is that going to be the same as a rural area that's pristine forest or a large patch of grassland. So it's really tough to get a true 
control. We try our best. Um, but with this particular project, um, we didn't have that luxury of pairing urban versus non-urban. Um, there are other really great research networks that do that, like um, UN, the Urban Wildlife Information Network, which is run out of, um, uh, I believe, a research group in Washington, D.C. Travis Gallo uh, runs it. And that research project um, looks primarily at mammals and they pair the urban versus non-urban in a very systematic way. Um, but with this program, with Snapshot USA, we want to get a pretty broad view of urban and non-urban mammals at one time. So we didn't really have that luxury. So instead, we did this kind of gradient approach of um, using a whole bunch of variables to factor in to say what urban means and kind of put it on that gradient of population density, housing density, impervious surface. But that's definitely that's, a problem in urban ecology. That's, just, that's a rule in general for ecological studies, trying to find good controls, especially across these landscapes where the landscapes themselves have so much variability within them. Um, yep. Yeah, what defines a hostile landscape or not? Who? Mm -hmm. So we also have a question here. Um, from uh, Katie Leonard. Do you think birds may adjust their territory sizes when being pushed out of urban areas? For instance, allowing the population size to remain the same by reducing the size of the ter territory in response. So what kind of interpopulation dynamics are going on there? Any behavioral mechanisms? Uh, definitely. Yeah. So that is a great question. Um, so I definitely, I think uh, a lot of species are flexible enough to shift um, territory sizes. Territory size usually is a function of how many resources are available on the landscape. So I always give the example in my class for whatever, well, Ethan and I were talking before um, from New York. I grew up in New Jersey. I like to think about pizza a lot in my life. So if I had a room full of pizzas, I wouldn't have to go very far to reach over and get a slice. But if the pizzas were like a mile away, I would have to go searching for them, try to find it, finally found it, okay, and I could come back. Same thing with urban versus rural. Um, especially if you're a generalist species, if you can really eat anything. If I'm an urban rat, I don't have to go very far. I could get my little snack. Why defend a huge area when all that I need is right there. So um, in terms of like flexibility with traits, um, this study that we did, um, which was run by uh, Catherine Weiss, um, we use that same Snapshot USA data set and ask that exact question of how flexible are some species with home ranges, with their body sizes even, um, in this urban uh gradient and we found that some species were highly flexible so the species that have these large error bars are the ones that are slightly more flexible within their traits that they're allowed to then respond to urban areas um, versus rural areas and they could shift their diet so there's a lot of data coming out about um, coyote diet in urban areas versus rural areas and how diverse in the foods that they are able to consume. So territory size is one trait that yes, it definitely can increase and decrease, but same goes for a lot of these other traits. Great, we've got a, another question here from uh, Dot Roseanne. Yeah. Any considerations of light pollution as a factor? Or at yeah. least a criteria. So yeah. <laughs> That's a great variable to assess. We didn't measure it in our study, um, but a lot of people do. And I think it's an excellent uh, variable to quantify urbanization. Um, same thing goes with urban noise. Um, behaviorally, these species are going to respond um, to these two types of disturbances. Um, and some species will respond in completely different ways. So unfortunately, we didn't study that in the projects that I was just discussing, but excellent, excellent one to do so in the future for a very standard and general approach, right? Uh, across the globe. Is it light out <laughs> at 1 a.m.? You're in a city or maybe very far north in the summertime. 
Yeah, just a, a couple, few more here. Um, yeah. A couple more, a couple that are like kind of more in in depth, uh, pertaining specifically to these studies. Yeah. And I'll try to tackle here. I know the 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 cats come up all the time, and there's one on pesticides being a factor. So um, somebody asked, what is the impact of outdoor cats over time? I wish you'd be able to assess my yard's biodiversity before and after we were overrun with outdoor cats. If someone's yeah. feeding, you know, we hear this all the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, any any we always know this can go on forever. But yeah. any 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 comments on cat impacts? So uh, as you could see in this one, cats were the most urban out of our uh, mammals surveyed. We actually got a lot of flack for including this in our study because a lot of people said cats are not native animals here. Why include them and why not include dogs? And we're like, they are a part of our urban areas. They have such an influence on the species that are able to survive uh, in our backyard habitats. So we didn't look at cat predation uh, in particular, but um, there was this huge review article that just got posted by uh, Chris Lepchek from Auburn University, who's a decent, a good friend of mine. Um, he's also part of the Urban Biodiversity Network, and he looked at the impacts of urban cats and just how destructive they are overall. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, they're not the best for our urban biodiversity, uh, especially birds and small mammals. Um, but we didn't measure that uh, in particular in this study, at least all of their consequences. That, that would be a great one to re-add that study you referenced to the meta-analysis done by Pete Mara and uh, Scott mm -hmm. Lawson. Those guys would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, we have, uh, what, what do we think about is we able to quantify or was pesticide use able to be a factor at all in these studies? Um, that is also a great, you're thinking, y'all are thinking of really good <laughs> variables to analyze. <laughs> um, especially with Katie's project with uh, backyard biodiversity and her um, uh, butterflies and birds. I believe we did ask the homeowners in the survey of how frequently, um, if at all, they used pesticides and herbicides. Um, we didn't analyze it because I don't think we had much variation in the data. I think everyone said like periodically. So if everyone's doing kind of the same thing, it's really hard to test uh, unless we do kind of an experimental design where we have controls. Um, but I would assume, yeah, with the use of it, we would see less both bird and butterfly diversity. But yeah, we didn't uh, analyze that statistically. Well, maybe you could get it indirectly through looking at uh, skin cancer and other cancer rates <laughs> that, are linked to, that are linked to them. <laughs> um, Christine, so um, there's a really nice comment in the chat that I think goes very well with um, what's the last question. But Jim Lowe, who's um, a friend of ours from Conservation Federation of Missouri mm. says, I'm thrilled to see you doing this work. It mirrors the groundbreaking field work done by the first large cohort of game animal biologists in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, laying the groundwork for effective management. And I just thought that was That's a super sweet. important, super important comment. Thank um, you so much. Groundbreaking and good for management. It's, it's so management great. strategies right yeah. um, it's so great and comprehensive because uh you know bill crawford said back in the day after the first 30 years of the conservation department back in conservation contrast he said we won't know uh we need to have good comprehensive studies because we don't know what information will be key to unlock the doors to future challenges yeah definitely yeah and I think a lot of folks, at least in my experience, um, going through my studies and research projects and talking with a lot of um, homeowners and uh, folks who are really excited to show me the biodiversity in their backyards, a lot of people take it for granted. Um, they think, oh, I see cardinals there in my backyard all the time. Who cares? It's like, no, <laughs> like this is amazing biodiversity. Um, and urban biodiversity shouldn't be thought of less than by any means compared to, I guess, rural, very non-urban uh, places. Um, I just think it's really 
a great time to get involved with urban ecology because it is still such a young discipline and there's so many great questions that have still yet to be asked and you're all asking a lot of good ones so I'm going to steal some of those for future work <laughs> but thank you that is a very kind uh, comment so thank you so much it goes well with our last question here Christine yeah. which is Judy asks We've lost approximately 70% of wildlife on the planet since the 70s. Does your research include ways to preserve the biodiversity that remains? Um, so we try our best to offer um, practitioners suggestions as to uh, apply what we're finding in terms of like the theoretical to what's on the ground. So with our urban biodiversity network in particular, um, a lot of us are urban ecologists, but we um, particularly pair and um, collaborate with a lot of um, urban planners, urban landscape designers, urban architects um, to kind of get those uh, suggested actions implemented. So um, the uh, there's a group that I'm a part of called Urbio. I'm part of the steering committee, um, and it's half urban ecologists and half uh, landscape architects and designers in urban areas. So we really do try to be in conversation with the folks that are doing the work on the ground because we, in my mind, we can't be an expert in everything. We need to um, build a network of all of these different types of experts in all of our fields um, to have conversations and get those things moving. Um, and also in these neighborhoods, especially working in Baltimore, that worked with a lot of community groups that were they had a vacant lot in their neighborhood and it was the pride of their neighborhood. So I gave them suggestions of what I was finding with urban bird biodiversity and what they could do. Um, so yeah, no, it's a really great question because it's one thing just to talk about it and not to enact these suggestions. Um, but no, we definitely try our best to get these things going on the ground. One last good comment here that I see that I'm not sure everyone saw, but good opportunity for advocacy at local, state, and national levels. So this is something that we can all really do, even just with someone else mentioned HOAs, yes. like even advocacy at the HOA level to not have rules regulating, you know, native plants or things that are considered untidy, as you said mm -hmm. before, Christine. Yes, so, definitely. And uh uh, Tessa knows that front to back because I would often preach about that in, in all the classes that she took from me. We had a lot of conversations about how HOAs can be leveraged for good. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, again, um, I know we only went through a few questions, but if anyone does have any questions, I'm always happy to chat in more detail. So feel free to shoot me a message. But Thank you so much for all of your attention and great, great questions. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye. <laughs>